Good afternoon. I'm Nancy Wadamakee, Vice President for Student Life. I'd like to welcome you to the second event of our Wellbeing You Speaker Series featuring Dr. Portia Jackson Preston. I will serve as a moderator for this event and facilitate questions and answers after the talk. You may submit questions via the Q&A link on the bottom of your Zoom screen. First Lady, Dr. Debbie Covino will give a welcome, followed by President Covino, who will introduce Dr. Jackson Preston. I know you're going to enjoy this event. Please let me turn this over to Debbie. Hi, everyone. Good to be with you today. I hope you're all staying well and doing well. Welcome to Wellbeing Use Speaker Series at Cal State LA. Before we hear from Dr. Portia Jackson Preston about the importance of self care, especially in this time of struggle during the global pandemic and national crisis, I'd like to thank you all for being here with us via Zoom. We're really looking forward to a time, Bill and I, in the not too distant future when we'll be able to see you in person again. And you know, for now, we're glad that we can connect with you in this way. Even though we can't see you, we do feel your presence and we're really honored to have you here to share in the knowledge and fellowship that we're gonna all enjoy today. You might be aware that what used to be mind matters is now well being you. And that we've hosted a rich speaker series over the years that has immersed the campus in lots of really interesting discussions about important subjects, such as destigmatizing mental illness, the intersection between social justice and spirituality, suicide prevention indigenous healing practices, and the way in which technology has reshaped our world, among lots of other interesting topics. Today's webinar is another significant contribution to our effort through the speaker series to contribute to your well-being and to remind you that you are all part of a caring campus community. Before I hand the spotlight over to President Bill Covino to introduce Dr. Preston, let me say once again, welcome, and thank you for giving me the pleasure of opening the wonderful discussion that awaits us all. Bill? Thank you, Debbie. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Great to have you all with us, uh, as always. And, uh, and I think the, the topic is, is one that we're all close to uh, in one way or another. To say that these are tough times is an understatement, a big understatement. Many of us are exhausted by the global pandemic, the nation's political turmoil, the demands of school and work and family. Even with all this, it's all too easy to think of self-care caring for ourselves as an indulgence, as an option that we'll choose when times are better. Of course, self-care is always vitally important. We can't afford to ignore it, especially now. Our guest today is a powerful advocate for self-care. Dr. Portia Jackson Preston is an assistant professor of public health at California State University, Fullerton, where she conducts research on multi-level approaches to self-care and examines stressors such as racism as drivers of health inequities. This important research and her personal experiences have given Dr. Jackson Preston a unique voice. Before joining Fullerton, he spent several years here at Cal State LA teaching healthcare policy and health delivery systems. Prior to her career in academia, she worked for Deloitte Consulting and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, consulted for the Susan G. Komen 
uh, for Susan G. Komen, Orange County, and founded Active Steps Coaching. Raised in South Los Angeles, Dr. Jackson Preston earned her doctorate of public health from UCLA, her master's of public health from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and her bachelor's degree from Stanford University. I'm so pleased to have her uh, Portia Jackson Preston here to share with us today because I know how much we can all benefit from her work and her perspective. Today, she'll explore key stressors that students, staff, and faculty are facing as a result of the COVID-19 crisis, racial and social injustice, and increasing equity gaps. You'll learn about tools to develop a self-care plan. With that, I am very, very happy to welcome back to Cal State LA, Dr. Portia Jackson, President. Thank you so much for that rousing introduction. It is such an honor and a privilege to be with all of you today. And I want to start by saying thank you so much to President Covino, First Lady Covino, to the Vice President of Student Life, Nancy Wada McKee. I'm so honored by your invitation to come back to a campus that I truly love and have a deep honor and appreciation for. You can see I'm wearing my Cal State LA shirt today, and I've been drinking out of my Rong Sheng Shu um, coffee mug all day long. So. I continue to be a proud member of the Golden Eagle family, and there's no place I'd rather be in this time than using my work to encourage all of you. So I want to get started by giving you a brief introduction to the system we're gonna be using today. I'm going to display some voting instructions for you. If you have a cell phone with a QR code reader, you can just scan this code. Um, if you do not have a cell phone, you can still go to this website, M-E-N-T-I, Dot com, and when you get there, you're going to enter a code that says 55549755. Now, the reason we're using this is because I want to engage you in an interactive discussion today where you get to cultivate a sense of community, even though we cannot be together personally. I want you to be able to see how what you are feeling is resonating with others. And the best way for me to do that is with a fully anonymous platform. So you will not need to download any software. You will not need to give your personal information. I'm gonna go ahead and remove this now, but you will see that this information will remain at the top. And I see that many of you have already made your way over. So I'm going to ask you if you are on this app, um, or this website, could you go ahead and just send me a heart? That way I know that everyone is here and we are ready to go. So I'm just gonna give you another moment to join. And I will say that I personally have obviously been experiencing this pandemic firsthand and what you will be getting from me today is a very honest and transparent and vulnerable conversation because I want to model for you the type of leadership that we all need to embrace in this time. I'm so proud of the Cal State LA campus for the work that they've done first with Mind Matters and now with Wellbeing You. They've really positioned themselves to have an authentic um, reckoning of what's going on in our society right now and how that affects the way that we all show up in this time. So I will not be lecturing to you today. This is really gonna be an interactive dialogue and we'll be able to share a lot of our thoughts together. And at the end, we will have some time for questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and move forward now that it looks like a good deal of you are in here. So the first thing I wanna ask you is how do you feel right now? Just pick a word that describes how you feel if you have more than one, it's okay to do multiple entries, but my goal is to fill up the screen with a word cloud that gives us a sense of the range of different emotions that we're experiencing here today. And I want to acknowledge, um, I see that some of you are not able to participate in Minty, and if you're putting them in the chat, I do still see your feedback. So thank you so much for that. I see that um, some of us are feeling hopeful. That's such a beautiful word. Um, many people are feeling anxious, exhausted, tired, overwhelmed, overworked, unmotivated. And I know it can be a bit overwhelming just to see all of this come in, but I want to tell you in all of the workshops that I've been doing, I think it's important to start out by holding space for where you are and how you feel right now and validating that. And I'm hoping that by the work that we're doing today in this workshop, you will have tools moving forward to accept how you're feeling and then to give yourself the appropriate care that you need to move forward. 
So that is the reasoning behind this. And I wanna thank all of you for commenting. Um, this is really what makes the presentation a blast. So now I'm gonna ask you to just take a moment and sit back for a moment. If you are somewhere where you can close your eyes safely, I wanna invite you to do so. And I'm gonna read this quote to you and ask you a few questions. So I'm gonna ask you to start just by taking a deep breath. Everything we want to change in the world around us also exists right here in our bodies. We carry the histories of our people's trauma and our individual struggles. They are here, both strengthening us with what they have taught us and also holding us back as our fears, anxieties, and survival strategies keep us away from the things that could most support our liberation. Now, I always like to start off my workshops grounding the room with this quote from Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, who developed the concept of intersectionality. And I think it's important because we cannot expect people to just show up in this space um, of academia as a staff member, as a faculty, as a student, without acknowledging that you have intergenerational stories of power as well as oppression that you're carrying with you. You are embodying the trauma that you're experiencing at this time. And it is our desire to use this platform to be able to empower you to reconcile and heal so that you're able to move forward and develop a stronger legacy for your family in your culture and your community in the future. So with that, I'm going to invite you to think about whatever is at the front of your mind right now. I know that you might have another computer screen open. You might be working on an assignment. You may have had a conversation that was emotionally charged in the past few days or so. Whatever it is, I want you to acknowledge that competing priority. And I want you to just sit it gingerly to the side for the remainder of our time together today. And I want you to think, when is the last time that I actually just took time and space to focus on my own well-being? For some of us, it's been a long time. And so before we proceed, I'm gonna ask you one more thing. I would like to invite you to set an intention for something that you would like to get out of today's session for yourself. And if you have that word in mind, you can go ahead and take another deep breath and open your eyes. Okay, let's go ahead and begin. So, I want to share this graphic with you. This was shared with me by someone at the CSU Chancellor's Office, actually, and it talks about the different stages of disasters. And I thought it was really interesting to look at what we're going through right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the challenges in the current political landscape and the ongoing fight for racial and social justice. So if you want to journey through the past year or so with me, I would say that maybe January to early March, we were in the pre-disaster phase where we had a looming idea of a threat, but we didn't have a classified um, pandemic. And I think of the impact stage as roughly mid-March when all of us very swiftly transitioned to virtual learning. And in the month or so after, we were really in this heroic and honeymoon stage where we were really talking about honoring healthcare workers and staying home to protect each other. And it feels like to me around the time that um, the infants with George Floyd occurred in late May, um, that really coincided with the pandemic hitting home for people in a very difficult way. A lot of us were facing economic pressures. Um, isolation. <laughs> there were a lot of different competing struggles. And I think that we've been rocking through this period of disillusionment. And what we've been going through with the election has really presented a trigger event. And I want to share this with you because I want to validate your experiences and let you know that you're not alone if you have had periods where you don't feel hopeful or that you feel discouraged. And I want to give you a vocabulary to use for how we begin to build our way forward. So I look at this graph and I think about how can I help the populations that I work with? Think about working through this grief, coming to terms with the loss of our old normal, and how do we begin to find hope to cultivate a new normal? So I think of this new reconstruction that we want to create, and I think we have to start envisioning that while we are in this disillusionment phase so that we have hope to go on. So that is my framework for how I am presenting today. I'm acknowledging the disillusionment, it's okay to feel it, but let's start thinking about how we can heal through this and construct the type of reality that we would like to see moving forward. 
And I want to thank those of you who are sending hearts. It lets me know that you're <laughs> resonating with the presentation. So the second thing I like to do, um, I've heard so much conversation as we think about Graduation Initiative 2025 about grit and resilience. And I think these are really important concepts, but I want to make sure that people understand resilience isn't just about being strong and being able to conquer everything that comes your way. When the pandemic first hit, I felt very frustrated with myself because I kept saying, I should be more resilient. I teach stress management. Why is this hurting so much? And then I had to go back and kind of meditate on the concept and remember, this is about the ability to get back up again. It's not about not being knocked down. I think all of us have been knocked down at some point in the past few months, but let's talk about what does it mean to be able to adapt in the face of this adversity? And I think it involves conversations like today starting a conversation that you can now take to your classroom, to your workplace, and really say, how do we begin to support each other so that we don't burn out, so that we don't give up? But it's okay to hit that rock bottom and know that you're not alone. We're all figuring this out together. So there's a few ways that the American Psychological Association um, provides context for building your resilience. The first thing is connecting with others. Just by virtue of you taking your time to be here with us today, you're engaging with community and you're helping to ward off isolation. The second is caring for yourself, which is what we're gonna talk about today. I like to think of self-care as a cornerstone for personal and professional development. And I just wanna underscore many things that both President and First Lady Covino said. We don't get to this point of perseverance without taking time to acknowledge we are going through a lot and we have to be able to care for ourselves in order to do the important work moving forward. The next step is to find purpose. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit today. And I'm gonna show you some tools that I'm using to find purpose in this time. And then they talk about embracing a positive mindset. And I always like to tell people, I'm not such an optimist where I'm numb to reality. I'm more of an optimistic realist. I completely embrace the fact that we have a very difficult reality right now, but I try to really work on rebuilding my neural pathways in my brain that would skew towards the negative and surviving to thinking about positive um, thoughts and possibilities that will help me to move forward. And then the last one is to reach out for help. I think that our society has done a lot to disincentivize people asking for help. We think of it as a sign of weakness. And I can tell you, the higher I go up in my life, the more help that I need to be successful. So I'm hoping that we will model that in today's conversation. None of you are expected to get through this time alone. So now I'd like to ask you, if you are participating either on your phone or your computer, please through the Mentimeter platform, let me know, what are you hoping to gain from today's session? This helps me as if I were in the room with you and I had a moment to speak with you before the session began, just to know where I should spend a little bit more time or what you are um, hoping that I will address. So I wanna thank you all so much. I'm seeing relief, coping strategies for stress, growth, a way to cope through the tough times, hoping to feel a little bit better, getting a sense of calm and balance, some strategies for self-care and stress management, to know that you're not alone. Absolutely. Many people are hoping for coping strategies and self-care practices. Great. We're in the right room today. This will definitely be on brand for you all. Some tools, techniques, and resources you can pass on to your students. The first thing I will um, acknowledge from a meta standpoint, the platform we're using right now is called Mentimeter. And if any of you um, faculty or staff want to engage your students in an anonymous way, there is a free version of this platform that you can use to do so. So that's the first one I will share with you. Um, how do you find purpose? Being able to cope with the light lockdown, um, going into this fall break and thinking about how can we um, take care of ourselves when we have a very different schedule and perhaps some new challenges. Staying on track with being healthy, finding a way to reconnect when things are overwhelming. You all have really, really filled this up with some great ideas. Good, good. Learning to adapt, <laughs> thank you. Good, all right. Thank you so much. And I want to acknowledge that I won't be able to read all of these, but I really am reading over them and taking them in just to make sure that I'm paying attention to you all and providing a very customized experience for you. How to create resting spaces when you're in the same house. Yes, that's definitely important. How to think positive, be motivated and keep going. Good. The best thing about using an interactive platform is that 
I can assure you, you won't just be learning from me today. You're actually going to be learning from each other. And I think that's so powerful because um, for many of you, it really matters to have people that you can relate to who are going through similar experiences that you are. So now I'm going to ask you, what is your affiliation with Cal State LA? And if you are not a um, current or former student, staff, faculty, or alum, I would invite you to select that you are a friend of Cal State LA because that will just help me as we are doing our next slide. I'm going to be showing you all a tool that really helps us understand that we are going through similar experiences no matter what our background and affiliation are. So I'm just going to give you all a few more minutes to finish filling out this slide. And I want to say thank you so much to all of the students who are showing up today. That is um, very, <laughs> it touches my heart. I'm happy to see so many staff and faculty as well. I'm happy we have several alumni here. And there are also several people who are friends of Cal State LA. So welcome to all of you and thank you for being here. I'm just going to give this another minute because I'm going to partition the next slide according to your results on this one. So if you're finishing up your voting, I'm going to go ahead and let you do that. I'll wait for the count to hit 100 at the bottom. All right, we are there. <laughs> so let's go ahead and proceed. It's okay if you weren't able to get yours in, but I have a general idea of who I'm talking to now. Um, a large amount of staff followed by students, faculty, alumni, and friends of the university. Okay, so here's why we did that. I am highlighting here just a few of the stressors. I know there's no way for me to account for every stressor piece of people are facing, but I wanted to come up with a visual real-time display for you to realize how are different demographics of this university being impacted by different stressors. So as you are voting, I'm gonna go ahead and read the options. You can select as many of these as apply to you. The first is concerns about COVID-19. Then racialized trauma, what does that mean? Um, if you are going through, I think you also hear this term as racial battle fatigue. So this is both within and outside of the institution, but this idea that you are carrying a burden where you have to either show up differently in different spaces, you cannot be all of yourself, or you feel that um, you're having to constantly affirm your dignity and humanity in spaces that don't validate you. Those are just a few examples. Another one is constantly being exposed to the trauma of people in your community who look like you and you're experiencing secondary trauma as a result of that. Um, the next is the political landscape. So that says everything, right? We just went through a contentious election and we're still working through what it's going to look like in the time to come. The next factor is isolation followed by remote online instruction, whether you are teaching online or you are um, taking your classes online, teaching children or family members, increased caregiving responsibilities, securing access to basic needs such as food and housing, and then the last is a general uncertainty about the future. And the first thing I want to acknowledge as these votes come in, no one has picked not applicable. Many times I've noticed that people think that people who are um, not students somehow don't have stressors. Everyone here has stressors. And you can see that most of these responses have at least three different demographics here. So the highest one is concerns about COVID-19, which makes a lot of sense given where the state has been the past few um, weeks with increasing numbers of counties moving back into the purple tier. So whether you are concerned about getting it, working as an essential worker, the implications of this pandemic for your economic situation, um, having had COVID or a loved one that has been exposed to it, all of these concerns, okay? All right, next we have this global uncertainty about the future. And I wanna give you tools today to help you deal with uncertainty because I know this isn't going away anytime soon. And our greatest power is to lean into transparent and authentic and constant communication. That is how we deal with uncertainty. Um, also a flexibility, okay? And that means at every single level, the way we get our work done, the way that we um, approach learning during this time. After that, the political landscape, very understandable. I know that um, from where we stand as a university, there are people that have different feelings about the outcomes of the election. And so this just really captures this, the impact of that stress upon your own life. The next one I think is isolation, understandable. So many of us have had radical 
changes to the way that we relate to other people. I myself was reluctant at a certain point to reach out to my friends because I felt like, what was the point of reaching out so that we all could just suffer together? And I've learned in recent months not to make those assumptions and that it really does make me feel better to reach out to people and still connect with them. But we have to think differently about how that's done. Next, we have remote online instruction. And I just want you to see the diversity in the responses here. You see for everything I've read off so far, we have student staff, faculty, alum, and people outside of the university who are impacted by these. But not surprisingly, we have so many students who are very stressed by the remote online instruction. Um, I know many students were very accustomed to taking in-person classes, and this has been such a shift and it's required a lot of a personal motivation to engage. So um, I would definitely want to acknowledge that stressor. Then let's see, we have um, many people have increased caregiving responsibilities. You can see that we do have students um, as well as staff who are teaching their children or family members from home, faculty as well. And then you can see that there's also diversity in terms of people who are struggling with access to basic needs. So I really want to encourage the university to um, Think about ways to show up and support each demographic of the university. I know that we have a necessary and essential focus on our students, but we also have faculty and staff that have been adversely impacted um, by stressors that have been exacerbated by this time. So I hope that this graphic has given you one, a reassurance that whatever stressor you're feeling, you are not alone. And two, an understanding that all of us are impacted by the stressors of this pandemic. And regardless of whether or not people disclose to you what their journeys are, this really gives you a good appreciation of how the Cal State LA community is being impacted by different stressors in this time. So thank you so much for your energy and your participation here. Um, I want to spend a moment just thinking about what are some of the common academic stressors. The first thing that I hear when I talk to students is they are really wrestling with motivation. This idea of not even wanting to pick up the computer and open it at the beginning of the day to get started. Struggling with a loss of sense of connection. Um, for many people, they struggle with the idea of even initiating and asking for help and going to office hours because they want, don't want to be disappointed. Um, I know I have students who, some of them are the now sole breadwinner for their families. There's so many reasons why motivation to do their studies has been impacted during this time. However, this is also something that I'm seeing in my conversations with staff and faculty and administrators. We're all struggling with motivation and we really have to be able to be more transparent about that and help to uplift each other to get through this time. The second is a sense of isolation and lack of connection. It's not the same. The first thing my students said they missed, they said, I just want to be able to go to campus and see other students. And seeing each other on Zoom, it's been awkward trying to overcome and work around that. And I know that a lot has been done to create community online, but this is still something that really has been a big issue for students. Um, this is universal faculty, staff, students. Everyone is feeling an overwhelming workload right now. And just this feeling of how do we continue to push, 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 push. And at a certain point, what happens if we run out of steam? And that's what I don't want to happen to you. This is the conversation I've been having with everyone since mid-March. We need to think more about prioritizing well-being and looking at mechanisms for performance that are more sustainable because the thing that I don't want to happen to a campus that I love is for people to be experiencing burnout and not be able to continue to do the work that is so important. Um, next one, I think this affects everyone, but students have definitely been saying, please talk to us about time management and how we can um, manage this because they feel like there's more work than ever. And they're just having a very hard time understanding how do I make incre progress, incremental progress and manage my time, especially when there's so many competing distractions and priorities. And then this other one I've already touched on, basic needs and resources. You just saw from our last slide that this is impacting everyone. So I hope that by providing this through an anonymous platform, you all can take this presentation and start having conversations about how is this stress impacting not just our students, but everyone in our campus community, and how can we come together to address this? And I want to acknowledge that there are amazing people on campus that are actively doing this work, and I want to applaud them for that. Please look into ways that you can support them because um, they're doing this work and they cannot do it alone. 
Okay, so now I'd like to hear back from you a little bit. What helps you to cope with these stressors that I've mentioned? And also I've already acknowledged there's other stressors that I haven't mentioned that I know are very real for you. So I hope that through this slide, you will start to learn from each other. If you don't have any good answers, I invite you just to sit back and you can get some ideas from other people. So people have, several people have mentioned meditation and music, getting help, whether that be therapy, for some people realizing that medication is a part of that and getting support with that, I definitely wanna destigmatize that. It's very important. Um, people have said taking time to tune out and watch um, something that they know that they'll enjoy. Reading, good. More people with exercise and sleeping, going for walks in nature, gardening, wonderful, wonderful. Listening to music, okay. Several votes for therapy, faith, taking time to yourself, crying. Yes, yes, letting your emotions out. That's very good. Going to the ocean, going for a drive, talking to people, doing puzzles, arts and crafts, swimming. There's so many good ideas here and you're gonna see these throughout the presentation, but I would like to activate your current knowledge first because I want you all to know that you're such a resourceful and powerful community already. And it's really just a matter of giving you opportunities to come together and have these conversations and to realize that this isn't the luxury, this isn't the reward that you get for doing your work. We actually need an element of play and relaxation in our lives to motivate us to keep getting up and doing the work. So this is really an important key of um, everything else that you're trying to accomplish here at this university. Someone says turning off the news. Very good. Yes, I actually just posted a video on um, moderating your media intake and I'll be sure to provide those resources to you. Okay, zooming with friends, cooking, wonderful. Um, pets, I saw come up several times, writing, cycling, playing a musical instrument, lots of hobbies. Okay, you guys are off to an amazing start getting off of Twitter. Yes, moderating your social media intake for sure. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to our next slide. Here's my question now. What gives you hope for the road ahead? And I realize this is a challenging question, but I want you to connect your feelings of despair and despondency to what gives me hope to continue to move forward. What can I look at and say, this is what I am fighting for. This is what matters to me. And again, if this is a challenging thought for you, I invite you to sit back and to look at the thoughts that other people are offering. So I always see a lot of people say their family. Um, yes, <laughs> their friends, their faith. Um, some people have said the shifts in the political landscape and leadership, um, getting a good job on the other side of this. Some people said school itself is a motivating factor. Um, your goals, wonderful. Um, parents, making them proud, yes. Um, someone says this will end someday. I always try to remind myself there's going to be a new reality on the other side of this. And I want to make sure that I'm healed and whole and resilient so I can contribute to that. And that gives me a lot of motivation to take care of myself right now when there's a lot of other destructing message, destructive messages that make it hard for me to otherwise believe that. I've had to be extremely proactive about identifying my purpose and my values in this time and coming back to that consistently. So whether it is your faith, your family, your friends, um, um, your dreams for the future. Someone else says it just has to get better. Um, being able to travel. I, I want you to think about what is it that motivates you? And I want you to start making that visible to yourself somewhere. I, I want you to put it somewhere that you see it often because that's what's going to give you the strength to continue to persevere. So I told you I have a few tools I'm using. I'm gonna be very transparent and share them with you. This is my current desktop background. Every time I open my computer, I see this beautiful woman who is being hydrated by water and surrounded by lush foliage because it was sent to me by a colleague. She got this off of um, amplifier.org. I'm gonna make sure you get a list of all the resources I'm mentioning, but it's a website that has free um, posters you can download. Many of them are social justice oriented, but it reminds me that I can't do any of this work that I very much care about if I don't care for myself. And I am someone who has dealt with multiple chronic health issues in the past. So I can tell you in a matter of days, if I'm not taking care of myself, it will show up in my health. 
So for me, it's critical to have this message constantly reaffirmed for me. Um, the work that I care about does not get done if I do not care for myself. I can stay up late one night, but I can't sustain a career that way. I can have a long work day, but I can't sustain a career that way. So that's what I try to think about. How long do I wanna be around? What do I really want to be able to contribute? Is it worth shortchanging myself in the short run? So that's what this poster says to me. I encourage you to find an image that works for you, that speaks to you and reminds you of what really matters. The next thing I wanna share with you is a vision board that I developed recently. I went to a workshop at a conference and um, this was created using Canva. That is C-A-N-V-A, C-A-N-V-A, canva.com. And if you go there and you search for photo collage, it will give you all kinds of templates. And then you can just draw in free images and make your own background. So this reminds me of the things that really help to maintain and feed my energy. It gives me the appropriate inputs so that I can give great outputs to people during this time. Um, the bottom left image, I think of my energy as a candle. And I know that if I protect that, it will keep burning and it will keep being of use. But if I expose it to the harsh elements, it will blow out and it will no longer be of service. So that's the th first thing to see that I draw into here. And that gives me the reminder, okay, let's hydrate, exercise, eat nutritiously, meditate, spend time in nature, spend time in community. I have a daily morning devotion time. Um, I am starting a garden, so I go out and I water it and I try not to kill my plants because I'm still learning how to do this, but it gives me hope. And then the last image um, is these turtles just remind me to slow down. I feel like I've gone through so much of my life being you know, if you've ever heard of the tortoise versus the hare, the hare, the rabbit gets off to a very fast start, but eventually it's the tortoise that is consistent and the turtle wins the race. So I'm reminding myself to embrace that mentality. I would rather do fewer things exceptionally well than to try to be everything to everyone and fail to myself. So you can see there's so many messages for me that are caught up in this. I didn't wait until January to set a New Year's resolution. I needed a reason to even deal with November and December. So I set these intentions for myself. I set these themes that I need to intentionally do. When I have difficult days, I remind myself, what is going to help you to protect your energy? What will help you to cultivate beauty, nurture hope in your life and restore your joy? I encourage you to come up with themes that speak to you. Those are just the ones that I chose for me. But these are two easy and accessible ways that you can remind yourself and create a narrative for yourself that anchors you so that you're not just um, vulnerable to whatever's going on in the news cycle. All right, so I'm going to give you all a break for a minute because we're going to do an interactive discussion in a moment and you're going to be typing again. So I just want to give you some ideas of what self-care really means. Self-care for me is everything that I do personally to advocate for and promote and protect my well-being. And so there are eight dimensions of wellness or well-being that I find very useful and they pair very well with the self-care assessment we're going to do. So the first thing is your physical health making sure you're taking care of your body so it can be healthy now and the future. That means not shortchanging yourself. The intellectual dimension is what you all are here doing at this university. And it's everything that you do to cultivate lifelong learning throughout your life. It's picking up the newspaper and being educated on the issues. It's taking um, courses and reading books in areas so that you can be a well-informed global citizen. It's taking your courses here at Cal State LA. This is a part of your well-being. The next one is emotional, being able to accept and validate the feelings that you have and then care for yourself. And also, I think that, you know, I was watching the um, talk that Father Boyle did previously, and he spoke so much about compassion and the power of compassion in our society. And I think that compassion for others starts with having compassion for yourself. When you love yourself, I think you live differently. So the emotional dimension is very powerful. Social dimension, this is everything that the university is doing right now to cultivate community during this time. Having the Wellbeing You initiative, having all of the different organizations you have that are meeting online. This is all about developing healthy relationships. It's also your relationships with your friends, your colleagues, um, people in the global society, um, your family members, all of this contributes to your health and being able to be of value to others gives uh, many of us a sense of purpose. The next is spiritual. And I want people to know that this is inclusive of religion and faith, 
but it's not exclusively that. So even if you are someone that does not have a um, religious um, belief, it's still about finding purpose and meaning of your life outside of yourself. So it's connecting with nature. It's having um, a mind body understanding that, you know, what goes on in your mind is important with your body. So there's a lot of different ways to think of the spiritual dimension. And I don't want people to write it off because they think it's exclusively about religious faith or beliefs. It isn't. The next one, vocational, think of job or occupation, being able to do work that gives you a fulfilling sense um, of purpose in your life. For me, I love doing this work during this time because it gives me so much purpose. So for me, my, my vocational well-being is very important. Um, the next one is financial. So learning skills like budgeting, learning how to live within your means, being able to have adequate resources to care for yourself, your financial well-being is critical. And then the last one is environmental. So this is about understanding the environments that are around you and being aware of how you can contribute to improving those environments, okay? So everything that I just talked about is relevant to how you live, show up in this world, relate to others. And it just gives you a much more integrated platform to understand why I think well-being is so critical to the work that you're gathered to do here. So I've given you just a brief introduction to this. I'm really interested to see if you all take a moment and you look at the different dimensions that I just went over, how would you order these? I'm curious to know what areas of well being are most important to you. And the reason that I'm doing this is that um, it's very easy for people to say, oh, okay, self care is important. We're only going to address professional self care. But if you have an understanding of your people and the different types of well-being that are most important to them, you have a key to what you can address that will help them to improve their lives. And that will ultimately affect how they show up in this space. So I'm going to give this a few moments to load. And I'm not going to stay long on this one. Um, I may not be able to get everyone in here, but that's just because I want to move you through a few more things in our time together today. So um, I will say that in most workshops that I do, physical and emotional are almost always the top two. So that's usually a pretty good place to start. But now if you're looking at this, you have an insight into um, how what is important to you ranks along with the rest of our community gathered here today. And you can see that for most of us, if we really want to make sure that we are addressing the intellectual and the vocational, there are other things that are really important to people that need to be balanced first for them to be able to really give of themselves in those dimensions. So thank you all so much for your time there. Okay, so we're going to briefly do this self-care assessment now. And this is so many of the things you guys have already talked about and said was foundational for you. But now you're going to get an interactive real-time display of how this ranks for everyone else. So I'm just going to briefly show you different practices in these areas. Um, for the purpose of the time, we're just going to do physical, psychological, emotional, and workplace or professional. When I get to this category, I'm going to invite you if you're a student and you're not working in a professional context to focus just on academics here. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Don't worry about taking notes. I will make sure you guys get the tools for this. Okay, so my first question is, which physical self-care practices do you currently do regularly? And you can check as many as you would like to. Thank you for your honesty. Yes, there's some of us who are like, I'm not doing any of these things and I need to do better. Um, Okay, so we can see that many people are making time to eat regularly, but some things that are more challenging um, are taking off time when we get sick. And during the time of COVID, that's really important. I know it can be challenging, but it's really important to prioritize our wellness. And this is something that we have to address as a culture. We have to make it okay for people to take care of themselves without compromising their financial well being or their job security. Um, I know that taking vacations is complicated right now because of everything that's going on with COVID. So, what it might look like is just getting outside of your home environment for an hour or two, going to a park, or since we're in LA, going to the beach, um, just taking a moment to be away from your current context. So I'm going to invite you to think about, is there something here that I'm doing well? And is there something here that I'd like to work on? Okay, let's move on to the next one. 
what psychological self-care practices are you doing regularly? So you can see the options range from disconnecting from your phone or email to reading something that's not related to work or going to therapy. Let's see how we are doing right now. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like two of the most popular responses are reading something unrelated to work and listening to your thoughts, beliefs, attitudes, or feelings. Um, a good portion of you are making some effort to disconnect. For those of you who are not, I want to challenge you to start very small. Um, one of the resources I'm going to send you is an app called App Block, and you can actually use that to um, make it so that your phone can't always get um, notifications or you can't access certain sites certain times. So I use that to keep me from going on the internet or social media, except for between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. So I'll make sure you guys get that resource. Um, I also use an app called Do It Later that keeps me from getting notifications on my phone and I can actually pick who I want to come through. I also can delay messages to go out later and I can do auto responses. So those are great tools. That's App Block and Do It Later. Um, Going to therapy and writing in a journal, I want to encourage you, if, if this is something you haven't explored recently, to really think about giving this a try. Um, the CAP services that you have on campus, as well as um, if you're an employee, employee assistance program. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't been able to find someone that is a good fit for you, to keep trying. For me, when I started at Cal State LA, one of the best things that I did was work with a therapist because they taught me how to balance caring for over 160 students while still prioritizing my own wellness. So I think it's a great part of your wellness plan. Um, I've also embraced writing in a journal to explore my emotions. So thank you so much for your participation there. What emotional self-care practices do you do regularly? Okay, there's a good spread here. So many people are finding ways, even during COVID, to seek out comforting activities, people, or places, and to spend time with people who nourish you. Yeah, for some people in my family who don't use Zoom, this means phone calls um, or driveway visits. But for a lot of my friends and family, Zoom and phone or text are really helping. Um, expressing yourself through social action. Think about what works for you. Not everyone is a frontline person, but we need that part and we need the part that you can contribute. So figure out for your values and principles, how can you be a part of advocating for change? Um, affirming yourself is always a low one for me um, in my workshops. And I just wanna tell people, it doesn't mean that you have to stand in a mirror and say, I like you, <laughs> that's good. But I think it's really about understanding that I can do hard things and I'm here for myself and I can ask for help and I know that I can do this, you know, things like that, just really affirming yourself. And that matters whether you are a student, faculty, staff, every single level, we really need to do a better job of affirming ourselves. Okay, so this is the last category we're gonna do for now. What professional self-care practices do you do regularly? And again, if you are a student and you're not working in a professional environment at this time, I want you to think about your schoolwork. Do you take breaks during the day? Do you take time to chat with your peers? Do you create quiet time to complete your task? Do you try to identify tasks that you enjoy doing and maybe use those to balance your time with some of the things that are more challenging? Um, setting limits and boundaries and communicating those. Balancing your workload, that can be difficult if you feel overwhelmed, but this is where you need to reach out to your professors and your support mechanisms on campus and um, ask for help. Um, arranging your workspace so that it's more comfortable. This can be difficult in a time where many of us are working and living in the same space. So that might mean taking down your space. It might mean putting a blanket over it. It might mean covering it with a sheet of paper, but um, to the extent that you can, try to have a good ergonomic setup so that you're not hurting yourself and taking breaks. I'm gonna send you a link to do um, a desk yoga exercise. It's only six minutes and it has subtitles in Spanish. Um, it's really great to share with, um, 
your, yourselves as well as anyone else you know that needs to um, take care of themselves during this time. And we can see one of the less reported ones is advocating for your needs. I can't underscore enough that we have to do a better job in this society of making it comfortable and safe for people to ask for help. And we reinforce that by giving them supportive answers when they reach out. Um, for many people in this population, it is very hard to ask for help because they know what it means to be shut down and turn away. So how we respond is very critical. And having a peer support group is so important. Constructing safe spaces where people can talk authentically about their challenges and get support is critical during this time. So I hope that going through this demonstration has given you some ideas of things you can do. I'm going to give you some tools that will give you all of these ideas and more. Okay, so I'm going to try to go through a few questions very quickly. My first question is, how can your self-care practice affect how you show up in your role as a student, staff, or faculty member? And I'll just take a few responses here because I want to preserve some time for questions at the end. Good. Someone says it can help them to be more calm and focused. Okay. It can be productive. It can be centered to better support my team. Good. It can be more motivated, able to manage change, be more present. Yeah, and I see productivity bumping up a lot. And I want you all to think about, yes, exactly, being more effective and selective in terms of productivity, because we don't want to be so productive that we burn ourselves out, but we need to do a better job of understanding what are my major priorities associated with my role and how do I effectively deliver those and how do I communicate? Am I in a safe culture where I can communicate when it's too much? And part of that is making sure that leadership is attuned to developing a culture that makes it feasible for us to have more sustainable levels of performance. Um, I can contribute to others. I can show more compassion. Yeah, exactly. Um, very good, very good. Be a better role model. Helps me to be present, be more focused. Okay, you all certainly are getting the connection here. Great. Okay, so now I wanna ask you, if you are a faculty or staff um, or administrator, what are specific ways that you can model self-care for those that you serve? And I know for some of you, this is a challenge, but I. Let's, let's think about how we can start to do this if we're not doing it already. Um, and then for students, if you are hoping to go into a profession, how can you model self-care for the people that you're going to serve? So for me as a teacher, if I show up and I'm irate and short with people, that is not modeling self-care. And it often means I'm not caring very well for myself. But I realized that whether I choose to or not, I am modeling professionalism for everyone that I work with. So I have to make sure that I am modeling good self-care practices so that my students understand that that is a part of being a professional and it's a healthy way to show up in the workspace. So you all have so many great ideas here. I'm not surprised given all of the work that you've been doing around this. Um, I'm seeing listening coming up a lot, doing group meditation, showing up, being honest, being positive, having energy, staying balanced. Okay, great. So many good things are coming up here. Saying no in a polite way. Um, being strategic about meetings. Is this really necessary? Is this the most effective way to do this? Okay, really love all of the ideas you guys have here. I'm gonna ask you very quickly just to identify um, which of these are barriers to your self-care practice. And I'm gonna start addressing them as the results are coming in. So as far as time, I'm not here to tell you to start working a certain amount of hours tomorrow. That's not how this works. I really am about a gradual approach of no matter how busy and overwhelmed you are, what can we do to start making self-care feasible for you? What are little things that you can work on so you build some momentum and early wins? Um, lack of financial resources. If we don't have access to basic financial needs, it's very difficult to think about doing self-care, but I do want to say all of the resources I'm sharing with you um, are pretty much free or have free versions because I believe we need to have a very equitable and inclusive approach to self-care. Not knowing where to begin, I'm going to provide you a plan in a moment to help you with that. The guilt for prioritizing your needs, that is always an issue. There's always feelings of guilt and I find that I have to override them and remind myself that caring for myself is foundational for caring for others. And then lastly, the motivation, finding early wins, little things that you can be successful at. So I was talking to a former Cal State LA student about um, self-care and they said, oh, there's no reason why I can't exercise every day for 30 minutes. 
I said, great, but can you start out with a minute <laughs> and do something that you really enjoy? Because I want you to have that early win and then keep moving forward. So if you think about the barriers that are under your control or the factors that are under your control, what can you do to address these barriers and remind yourself to practice self-care? How can you overcome barriers related to time, financial resources, not knowing where to begin? Good, starting small, exactly practicing. This is a journey. I don't want you to say 2020 is the year I did self-care. I am constantly revising my schedule and doing this. Committing time on your calendar. Good. Yeah. And it has to work for you. Somebody else said accountability partner. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm seeing lots of great ideas here. So thank you. Okay. So I'm going to briefly move through some organizational level efforts. Um, for those of you who are in leadership positions, I want you to think about how can I identify and address workplace stressors, make opportunities for my people to engage in positive stress coping behaviors. In the classroom, this might mean um, allowing students to do a brief meditation with you or talking about how you're balancing your energy during this time. Um, and think about how do we make these changes a part of our organizational culture. Um, encourage people to engage in best practices, asking for help, communicating their concerns, maintaining and supporting their work-life boundaries, and delegating. Finally, recharging using available benefits and resources. There's no use in having a lot of the benefits we have as a university if people don't have any time or energy to use them. Um, as far as where do you begin, we talked a lot today about noting how you feel. We talked about the importance of having healthy boundaries, focusing on what is under your control, and taking concrete action in line with your purpose. And I'm going to show you something now that's going to help you to do that. This is the resource that you're going to be receiving to help you develop a self-care plan. It is free. You can share it with anyone that you want to. I do it with everyone from students to college presidents, and it will help you to identify the positive and negative ways that you are coping with stress in your life. It helps you to go through each of those areas of self-care we talked about earlier and rank how you're doing in those different areas. You will use that information to develop a maintenance self-care plan, and then you will have for the times where you don't have time for self-care, an emergency self-care plan. If you can't do anything else, start with this one, but I will be providing you with YouTube videos where I actually walk you through every single step of this. So you don't have to worry about doing this alone and you can absolutely reach out if you have questions. I'm gonna continue doing YouTube videos to help with different topics. So if you comment on any of my current videos and let me know what you need, I will definitely look to do um, more videos for that. And I wanna reiterate what someone said about having accountability. Um, decide on one person in your personal or professional life who you can talk to about your self-care plan and then review it frequently, okay? I'm gonna leave it on this slide and I'm going to ask um, that we move into question and answer. I wanna thank you so much for your time. Um, please take a moment to fill out this survey as we're doing the Q&A because I wanna be able to provide feedback to Cal State LA about what resources are you finding helpful to practice self-care? And then second question, what resources, policies, or practices can help you address barriers to self-care? And this is gonna be completely anonymous, but I really, if you could do one thing for me today, much to show your gratitude, it would be to fill out this survey um, so that I can help use this talk to um, empower your community moving forward. Thank you all so much for your time and listening to my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Jackson Preston. Um, we don't have very much time for questions, but I will, um, uh, we have one question here in the chat that I thought would be good to, um, to address. Um, the, the, here's a question. The self-care practices I like the most, I can't do because of COVID-19. I feel like I'm stuck. What can I do? I would say you have to be open and curious to finding new things to do. Um, some of the things that I love doing are no go right now. So I think that's why I considered the prospect of gardening. I never would have done that before, but I realized it was a way that I could like nurture and watch something grow during this time. So I would encourage that person to at least go through the self-care plan. And as they're going through the assessment, they're going to see all of these different ideas and they can just try some things to experiment with. This is an opportunity for growth. It's not being packaged to us that way, but there's a such thing as 
post-traumatic growth. And it is even in this experience, there's things that we can find a way about ourselves and develop in new ways. Great, great. And maybe here's one more quick question. Mm -hmm. My family doesn't always understand my self-care practices. How do I help other people learn to support my self-care practices? I, I honestly think we have to validate ourselves here. You, you are not, that's out of your control. So um, I, I think that we have to show up for ourselves and, and live what we know is important to us and allow other people to have their own journey and respect it. Great. Well, thank you. For, for all of our participants, um, Dr. Jackson Preston has shared a number of resources and we will email them all to you following the presentation. But right now, I just want to thank, um, thank you so much, Dr. Jackson Preston. I think I can speak for everyone that being in community with you this afternoon was a balm for our souls. Aww. You know, most of us are looking forward to Thanksgiving celebrations that will feel a little lonelier this year. And um, your advice about resilience really resonated, that it's about getting back up again. And because we all took time out for ourselves by showing up and participating in your webinar, we took an important step in doing just that. So thank you again on behalf of your forever home, Cal State LA. Thank, thank you. you so much. I love you all. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>